Vanderbilt actually had more money than the U.S. Treasury. Wall Street's been really good at making people feel like insurance is boring, like it's not sexy. They didn't really have these conversations that the Rockefellers did, and now the Rockefellers have over 200 people benefiting from the trust. What is it that the Rockefellers do? This is the question I went in with. What is it that they do that anyone can do? I think passing money on to the next generation tax-free is the easy part. I think having the person not feel entitled not become spoiled, requires a lot of attention and intention along the way. Multiple sources of distraction, more than multiple sources of income, is what happens. And focus on that cash flow first. So so a couple uh, a couple of directions we're going to take this. Uh, first direction we're going to take is just talk about the Rockefeller uh, conversation. And, yeah. and oftentimes people say, I want to create generational wealth. I want to create generational wealth. For, by the way, first question I want to ask you, because this has been a, a topic of intense debate amongst our offices, because we tend to recruit a lot of people from a real estate background, a tax background, a legal background, you know, uh, a T-shirt background. They got a clothing company. And a lot of people think that, man, I need to make multiple streams of income. And my pushback sometimes, with them, which is not agreeable to a lot of them, I said, just focus on one thing real quick. Focus on one thing for the mm -hmm. first you know, make your first cash flow million first. And then that's been yes. my debate on it. And I don't know if you agree with that or not, but. I love that philosophy. And I do agree with it, Matt, because I feel like multiple streams of distraction can happen where we get spread thin. And what if one of the streams dries up? Now we go divert our attention to that and we're not caring for the other streams. And I kind of think about the Amazon River. It's this fresh river with so much life around it and so much life in it that I'd be scared to go in it, right? Yeah. And it flows so powerfully into the ocean that you can find fresh water for miles into the ocean where the, where the Amazon comes in. So create that powerful flow. And when that powerful flow is maybe 80% something that happens without your daily attention and time, then it might make sense to create another stream. But the problem is if we have a bunch of streams, they're just not powerful enough. There's, and, and we get derailed and distracted and I call it being diversified because <laughs> how could, you know, and then it starts infringing upon our health and our family and time to ourselves because we as human beings are terrible at discerning opportunity from distraction. And there are things that can make you money that are a distraction because they prevent you from making the most money. Literally a conversation I'm having with my business partner today is you know some of our team members one of them wants to make more money and they're like well i was thinking about going and doing some freelance work and i'm like well what if we could create opportunities within the organization and make sure that your time is most well spent versus getting into another thing that takes a lot of momentum because as you know starting something from scratch requires herculean effort versus when there's already a platform and already an infrastructure that you could plug into and build from you can have accelerated results. So I started in 1998 selling life insurance. And the first, you know, the first type of insurance that I sold, uh, well, actually in 1997, I bought a variable universal life, a yeah, variable yeah, universal yeah, life, yeah, yeah, yeah. which yeah. I'm not, a, I'm not a big fan of variable universal life based upon certain things. We could discuss that, but it got me in the game and I started to ask questions. And then what I found was Selling insurance for a few years from 1998 to 2005, I made a good living. It created recurring revenue. And I really focused my attention there. I didn't do assets under management. I didn't you know, build a lot of other things. It wasn't until 2005, we started to do workshops and I started to write, you know, uh, create a membership and do books and things like that, which eventually drew my interest and was where my heart was at which I think has improved the industry. Like I, I've met yes. a lot of people that I didn't know who they were. They're like, oh, thanks for your book. And I, I like that, right? Like that called to me, but there's not a lot of people that are weird and crazy enough to sit down and write a book. I have a book deadline this week, as a matter of fact, and it could be a bit strenuous. And, and it's like, we kind of forget about the pain as authors of writing a book and they're like, oh yeah, that wasn't so bad. And they're like, oh wait, the editing process and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's, you know, there's a lot of like, people getting distracted because it looks good from the outside. Oh, I want to do that because someone else has done that. Or, ooh, I've got this opportunity over here and that opportunity. Ooh, maybe I could go uh, flip NFTs and then I can go, you know, buy the next crypto thing. And then I could do an, an insurance thing. Nice. And then I could get into real estate. And what happens is you never develop your expertise fully. You end up being able to give half effort or less to a bunch of different things that other people, if they put full effort to, will surpass you. 
And so I'm with you. Multiple sources of distraction, more than multiple sources of income, is what happens. And focus on that cash flow first. Give us, you know, you came from this ins- in this insurance industry, and now you're moving on to the next chapter of your life, edutaining people through through comedy. What would you tell a new agent today, a new agent today, about the the opportunity of the industry, the success of the industry, the the good, the bad, the ugly? What would you say to a new agent today entering the field? When I when I entered the field, they said that like four out of five people within five years were no longer in the field. And I think that if someone's thinking that it's a time for money thing, no, it's it not all effort is created equal. So what type of training do you have? What kind of culture is there? What kind of like willingness are people have to help you? But are you willing to be responsible for the outcome of your income? This is basically an entrepreneurial venture within a structure. There's a structure where there's training and there's support, which a lot of entrepreneurs don't have, but your upside is only limited by your willingness to add value to people's lives, which means you have to gain a skill set of communication. So when you can find a firm that A, can tell you about what's wrong with the policy, the early firms I talked to couldn't tell me what was wrong with the policy that they preferred. You know, the BUL people, that was the only way to go. And then the whole life people, that was the only way to go. And it was like they were a one trick pony. And so if you can get clear about the, the, the strategy, the tactics and the pitfalls, then it's who helps you grow as an individual? Who helps you to really recognize your potential and help you thrive? But you can only thrive through your own personal responsibility and accountability within that structure. This isn't a handout business but it's one that can be richly rewarded if it calls to you. And it's one that I think can create a massive amount of value for the marketplace because let's face it, like people that have millions of dollars get pitched all sorts of investments. But people that are just trying to make it, they need to design their insurance properly so they have safety, stability, security, whether they prematurely die that the money comes in or whether they live a long period of time that they still have cash. I feel like putting 50 bucks into a mutual fund is like throwing it away, but you know, doing something in an insurance contract for the middle class, you can design that fairly close to how the Rockefellers did. And that's super unique because if you want to get the investments, the Rockefellers got to good luck, you got to be the Rockefellers. But if you want to design insurance the way they did, you can come fairly close. They had private placement. You know, you're going to be inside of a, of a contract that you can fund up until the MEC limits. And it's fairly close. It's not the same, but it's close. And it's infinitely closer than anything else that those wealthy families did with their money that you could actually do on your way up. Yeah, and I, awesome. I don't know what 60 seconds is because that was probably 180 Hey, bro. It felt like, it felt like 30, man. Uh, you, right, you, 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 uh, yeah, I've been in the industry for a while too as well. And uh, I just love talking about the journey of this. Like, for example, you know, the product itself hasn't changed my life. I'm not, obviously, I'm still here. You know, it hasn't massively changed my life because, you know, I've, 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 barely, I've barely dipped into my life insurance policy very much. But the industry has changed my life absolutely 100%. You know, just being able to be an entrepreneur with no college degree, without a sales or financial background, and have the opportunity for somebody to mentor me and coach me and pull me up to the next level, such an invaluable thing. And then if I make a mistake, it doesn't cost me a lot of money either. If I, if I screw up, I just got to swallow my pride, swallow my ego. A lot of people start a business, they're losing millions of dollars in inventory and supply chain and all this crap happening. And Man, then- this, this does have less moving pieces, which means you can get out of the gate a lot faster. Like I I started it at a company that gave me a base salary, but I got, I had to earn the commission to to keep that. And then I could make more than that. And what was nice is I'm 19 years old and I'm getting good training and I'm around people and I'm asking a lot of questions. I was labeled a fanatic because I asked too many questions because I wanted to know, especially after 2000 happened. And I felt like I made, I didn't put my clients in the best situation. You know, but it really opened up my eyes to like, wow, that was that was the best way for me to be an entrepreneur from 98 to 2005. And then I took a little harder route with books and, you know, it, you know, creating yeah, self-study content and stuff <laughs> like that. But, it, yeah. but it's rewarding. But I got to tell you, like, if I would have just stayed with that, my renewals, I had to walk. I walked away from my renewals. You know, I walked because in order to, to create the content I create and be with the our the you know, the, the, what was it? Park Avenue securities. They wanted everything pre-planned and programmed. And so I had to, 
I had to cut ties in order to, yeah. in order to build this. So, um, but the nice thing is you guys create it more entrepreneurial than they did and, and create an opportunity where someone can actually build a business within that business. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity within that. And it's with a real product. It's with something that really people can utilize and benefit from versus just, you know, is, is something that's a miracle potion that isn't a miracle. <laughs> what, what's yeah. something about the Rockefellers that a lot, what's some of the factors about the Rockefellers, Garrett, that a lot of people don't know about today as a, as a result about their money? Well, look, one thing is that they were not nearly as wealthy as the Vanderbilts were at one time. The Vanderbilts actually had more money than the U.S. Treasury. And so they were global. And, and with what was going on in shipping and when Cornelius died, his oldest son doubled that estate in nine years, but then he died and they had no infrastructure or plan of what to do next. So it ended up getting decimated heavily over the next 54 years because 54 years later, the first Vanderbilt died broke. Now, you know, Gloria Vanderbilt had still inherited some money and Anderson Cooper, her son, her son. could, you know, there's some stories out there about them, but the last time uh, it was documented the Vanderbilts got together for a family reunion, there wasn't a single millionaire there. So they gave a million dollars to create Vanderbilt University, and they still have their name associated with that. But they used to own the Breakers in Rhode Island. They don't own it anymore. They own 10 mansions in New York. They don't own those anymore. They own the Biltmore Estates in the Carolinas. That's gone. What they did was they became massively good at consumption, and they didn't have any type of structure to perpetuate the wealth which really the, the Rockefellers did two things amazingly. Well, three. Um, first off is they made oil affordable to everybody and that really gave them a rise, right? But then what they did was the Rockefellers bought insurance policies as you were talking about on their kids. Said, hey, if a Rockefeller's born, we're gonna use this. The death benefit comes in tax-free upon their death and helps to replenish the trust because we think the trust will grow, but because of taxes, because of economics, because of you know, interest rates or whatever, we want to create these additional safeguards. And they did that. But they also created a family office. And obviously, they're worth so much money that they just had their own team working just for them. They had accountants, attorneys, investment advisors, cash flow specialists, risk management people working just for the Rockefellers. And that kind of where this concept of the family office was born. A, a family had their own financial office working just for them. In today's world, we've seen that become more accessible to the common person because like what I built at my firm, Wealth Factory, is we went and said, let's find attorneys and many of them and accountants and many of them and make sure they communicate with one another. But then as we help our clients, they can meet with all these different people. And those people still have hundreds of clients versus just one client like the Rockefeller's family office. But see, what happens is now when something happens to an heir or when something happens to a Rockefeller, the financial team is still in place to support and there was still instructions and ideas and the kids came to meetings over time. And so this kind of changed things that a, they, you know, wall street's been really good at making people feel like insurance is boring. Like it's not sexy. Like, why would you want to do that when we've got these really cool things over here and they, they've created a really amazing narrative. But as you look into the Uber wealthy, if you look at K ones of the fortune 500s and look where they're putting money, if you look at, corporate-owned life insurance, bank-owned life insurance, or you look at things like private placement life insurance or premium financing, those are just, for, you know, coley bully premium financing and private placement life insurance. The ultra-wealthy all have those resources. The banks have those, corporations have those, and super-wealthy individuals. But why is it that the average person or the middle-class person has this narrative that says, no, I should just put my money in diversified portfolio and let that ride. And, and then in a retirement plan, I'll be okay 30 years from today. Well, the news is out. 95% of them are not economically or financially independent when they're 65. But they're putting money in there. It's just, A, they're maybe not putting enough. B, the returns are not what they're purported to be because of a lot of fees and volatility and you know uh, taxes that they didn't take into consideration. And so the, the Rockefellers were saying, hey, we know how to make money in our businesses. We'll make money there. Yeah. We'll store money in these insurance plans where it's protected from liability, where it's protected from bankruptcy, where it's protected from taxation, where upon our death, we can replenish our entire trust. And they've got over 150 people getting interest off of this trust today. They're on their sixth generation where the yeah. Vanderbilts 
have no trust. They're not passing money on because they had a family office and because they utilize the power of life insurance and its tax advantages. So, so that's a, that's a big departure between those two families. How many, how many Rockefellers today, Garrett, are supported and funded and financed by the Rockefeller Trust? You had a number when I wrote, when I wrote the book, it was over 150 Jeez. and we've been trying to get more information. We think it's closer to 200 people now. Um, but you know, David Rockefeller who recently died, I saw some amazing interviews with him where he as a young man, didn't really know how wealthy his family was. He found out from kids at school, how wealthy his family was and how well known they were because the family was really trying to cultivate their kids to learn how to be productive. And they would have these family retreats as he grew older, where he started to understand the amount of responsibility and money they had because the retreats were around, you know, how they could be proper stewards and what the family values were and, mm -hmm. you know, how they were going to operate overall. And so these retreats became an integral part of their family. Um, and it's important because, you know, the book, The Millionaire Next Door yep. really is the opposite where there's these families that have some money, but they yep. never tell anyone about it. They, they, they pretend like they're poppers or they don't have much cash. And then when they die with little planning, because they're not willing to pay for estate planning, that money falls into their heirs laps and they go, what? And they blow through that money very quickly because they're not mentally prepared wow. at all. And so that's one of the things you don't really hear about that book. And, and look, man, that was my, my book I read when I was like really very, very first year in college. Read that book. I'm like, dude. And it just reinforced me being a miser that pinched pennies and didn't want to spend any money. And then the next year I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, which was a complete departure from that. And I was like, wait, assets creating cash flow. Wait, like it's not about what you reduce, it's what you produce. It was like that was a game changer. So yeah. so I think that, you know, it's interesting studying the Rockefellers. I haven't done it in years, but when I was writing the book, I just said, what is it that the Rockefellers do? This is the question I went in with. What is it that they do that anyone can do? Not what is it they could do that only wealthy people can do, because obviously having your own family office, you have to be pretty wealthy. Yeah. You know, um, inheriting a bunch of money that you're if you're starting first generation that, yeah, they're in a different place now. But there were steps that they took. And I said, how can I design that to be most safe and effective for the majority of people that I'm teaching? Which yeah. means, you know, there's some different ideas around insurance that we can discuss today that a yeah. lot of people, you know. Yeah, for sure. I go, well, what about this? And what about that? But uh, uh, I want to go back to, to, to high school because, you know, you talk about uh, the pain that you had because I think a lot of people start a career or a business because of the pain that they experience right. as a family member. And so is, was there like a specific pain or is this the overall experience of growing up and having uh, the lack of finances? Was there like a, like a pain or a wound that uh, you want to make sure that you, that you healed? Well, look, my dad went to college and then his family wasn't doing well enough, so he left college to go to the coal mines to help support his family. Got it. Okay. And then my parents wouldn't even let me step foot in a coal mine. Because when you're a coal miner's son, and it's summertime, they're like, oh, we've got these great jobs for the yeah. summer, and they offer, you know, back then it was like 25 bucks an hour, which seemed like a ton of money. Oh, wow. They're like, it's just a trap. They're like, you're doing something else. You're gonna use your mind. And so they, my parents really invested in that, and I saw, the life of all my uncles that are that are miners yeah. now Toronto miners. I saw the life of you know yeah. my, my dad like pulling out dead bodies during mine rescue. Yeah. I mean there was just yeah. it wasn't really a, a great life. And fortunately, I even had like teachers that helped me with this rural young entrepreneur competition and like people that worked with my mom that knew yeah. accounting showed me how to create balance sheets and income statements from a business when I was a teenager. So and my family was super supportive. My grandfather and grandmother were my first clients. <laughs> and look, we, we raised their net worth, this doesn't seem like a lot, but $270,000 yeah. over a nine year period of time when the market took a, took a dive yeah. and their house was worth $39,000 when they died. So to give perspective yeah, of that, yeah. and that was like 50,000 yeah. tax free to each one of their kids and both of two of their kids within a couple of years had kidney transplants that covered all their co-pays and all wow. that, all, you know, so it's like, yeah. it was a, I, I got to see that impact and they believed in me early on and, yeah. and that was the helpful thing. So when, when you're, when you're uh, getting involved in, in, in finance, uh, one of the areas of work that you've done, I think you've studied a lot of, you wrote the book, you know, what would the Rockefellers do? What was the most interesting thing as you're doing your research, you're just doing a deep dive obviously in both the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts, what was the most impressionable thing that you saw? Because they were both men that built America. David Rockefeller didn't really know his family was wealthy other than the way that the kids at school would talk about it. 
But what they would do is they would do these semi-annual retreats where all the Rockefellers would get together hmm. and they would like do these, you know, like investing in their education and how to manage money. And they weren't just handing it off to the person and saying, here you go, or the Vanderbilts. I mean, Cornelius had more money than the U.S. Treasury at one point. <laughs> he passed it on to his eldest son who doubled that over nine years, then died. And then the next 54 years was a trail that led to the first Vanderbilt dying broke. Mm. And they own 10 properties in Manhattan that they don't own anymore. They own the, oh. the Biltmore Estate. They don't own that. They own the Breakers in Rhode Island. They became wealthy socialites because they never really talked about like how to develop as a person. They didn't really have these principles. They didn't really have these conversations that the Rockefellers did. And now the Rockefellers have over 200 people benefiting from the trust, but you don't really see the trust of Fari and, you know, trust fund babies that, that aren't doing anything where, yeah. where the Vanderbilts, I mean, yeah, there's Vanderbilt University. They gave them a million bucks, but compared to what they had. Yeah. Did they change the name from what, Central University to Vanderbilt University? Was it yeah. Like? So it's yeah. like they, you know, so they donate some money. So I just, I just saw that they had completely different methodologies right. of how they handled things in their family, even though it was an extraordinary amount of wealth. And, you know, there's things that you could find fault in along the way, but there were so many good things. And what I, what I, you know, I think the Rockefellers pretty much coined the term family office, yeah. where they had these financial people that worked just for their family, yeah. right? So now they had continuity yeah. when a Rockefeller would die. It was comprehensive, it was coordinated, they all communicated with each other. The Rockefellers knew it existed. They had this family bank that they could utilize the funds and not have to rely on everything else. And, and they had rituals, traditions, and symbols within the family hmm. that kind of held it together. It's like they ran their family like a business. Yeah. And yeah. businesses have meetings, and they have mission statements. And, and accountability, they have, responsibility. Right, and they have yeah. logos, and they have, <laughs> and, and that's basically what the Rockefellers did. And, yeah. and you saw that you know, pass Prime on a lot of wealth over these generations. You know, a lot of people didn't realize that Anderson Cooper was actually a Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. He is the son of a, a Gloria. Gloria, Gloria Vanderbilt, right. socialite, you know, socialite, the fashionista, all that stuff. Right. He, he has an article out there he, that he doesn't believe in inheritance. inheritance. He doesn't believe it. So right. your, your comments on that. Right. He had to fight for his credentials. And okay, I, you know, like he didn't have money handed down to him. I get that there's a lot of people, if they're not intentional, I find that two things happen. Either one, they go, I'm going to give everything to charity because I'm worried about ruining my kids or I'm just going to give the money to my kids. And a lot of times that does create a problem. Yeah. Instead, being intentional, I believe in like having a family constitution, which captures your core principles, philosophies, and it's the preamble to your trust. Yeah. So now you have like your most important lessons that are left behind as signposts that could be a dynamic way for people to start interpret what has happened, why the family earned the money, and start to pass on these values that start to live in future generations yeah. instead of just handing down money. I think passing money on to the next generation tax-free is the easy part. I think having the person not feel entitled not become spoiled requires a lot of attention and intention along the way. So these family retreats that are happening all the right. time, a family office is part of that component, that family constitution that says, here's what we stand for, here's who we are, here's our mission statements, here's our guidance, here's our principles, and this is what we live by. And you start to instill that at a young age. Yeah. So it becomes part of how that family operates versus ignoring it. And then all of a sudden a bunch of money comes in and sure. they're like, cool, let's go spend. Right. For example, a lot of people today, sadly, because of certain policies over the years, they've been married and divorced. And there's a lot of blended families that happen. I'm a blended family between uh, my wife and I. So how do, you, how do you install that with older kids that sadly go back to the parents that's not part of this family conversation? They go back to, let's say, for example, we're capitalistic parents, but the exes are so, more socialistic. Right. We, we, we saw um, a family come in in their late 60s and work with Wealth Factory. And we were doing these legacy events. And, and the thing is, they're bringing in kids and even grandkids that they didn't have this along the way. Mm. But what happened is it transformed their family, even though they started late, because they really got intentional about it, which the crazy thing is, they were only doing like a million dollars of revenue when they came in. And even doing the family work led to over $10 million of revenue within three years. Wow. Because you had the, the mom who's in her late 60s wanting to be a grandma, but she's trying to help her husband yeah. in business. He's constantly so busy and overwhelmed. Yeah. And then it turns out his son and daughter-in-law both had skill sets and connections that they brought into the business that started to grow that business. Now he's working 25 hours a week, 
retires his wife from having to work in the business, she gets to be a grandma, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden there's room for creativity, yeah. there's new conversations happening within the family. So that's someone who started late. That's someone who, their kids were already in their late 30s, yeah. and they had the grandkids. But it just takes like starting with, how do you have the first family retreat? I always recommend finding something that would be fun for the family to get them together, and just have an hour where you just dedicate a conversation. So rather than trying to do it perfect all at once, because yeah. there might be people that are, you know, yeah. harder to, to, you know, have conversations it, it, it with, went over or, to the conversation. or yeah. you know, they're on a second marriage, or there's, mm -hmm. you know, or there's someone that doesn't, you know, come right to way. stuff yeah. or everything, yeah. and it leads by example, but but allowing people to start have a voice because people support that which they help to build. Yeah. And when they can actually start to build it, like when we built our family mission statement, we actually have a big, you know, metal looks like a medieval shield cool. that's above our, and our kids got to talk about what are the symbols that are gonna be on that? What do we stand for? Yeah. Who are we? And then we unveil it to the whole family. Yeah. And then we have these weekly meetings where we're talking about, and weekly, that's maybe a stretch. Most of the time, we have these meetings and we're just like, hey, how are we doing on a scale of one to 10 as parents? What skill are you working on this week? Let's read through the family values this week. Next week, maybe we read through the family mission statement. So we have the very things that any business would have but start integrating in the family so it starts to become part of our lives. And I get, it could be complex over time, there could be divorces, there could be sure. you know, turmoil within the family, but I think you start to diminish some of that by having this happen. And then maybe that, that first time you get together, there's an hour spent on it, and then you're like, hey, we'd like to do another one where we maybe spend a little bit more time, we'd like to hear what, you, what your thoughts are on it, maybe even bring someone in to facilitate so that it's not the pressure just on one person who... Smart. Yeah. yeah. By the way, that means sit down, have a conversation, put the phones away, right? And have a conversation and dialogue. Yeah, it changed our family's life when we went to Italy for a summer where we weren't on the phones all the time. You'd go into the town square, this little town called Capalbio. There'd be like 100 people in this little town square getting gelato. They're playing cards. There's no phones. And I think it really got me connected to my kids at a different level. Hmm. And it got us to like start talking about things we wouldn't talk about because we're in the pool every day. Yeah. We're playing cards every day. Yeah. It just kind of broke the patterns of business that we have in our lives. How old are your kids now? They're 13 and 16. And my youngest, wow. actually, when we filmed my special, opened for me and did comedy. Yeah, very so cool. So 13 years old, crushed it, took the, the energy of the crowd up. It was really cool. Are they uh, boys, girls? Or stuff? Two boys. Two, two older boys. You got, yeah. you got a king's yeah. family, man. <laughs> yeah, the 16-year-old, uh, you know, he's, he's a little harder to get engaged sometimes. The, the you know, the, the but, we, but we still, yeah. you know, we have a cabin that we go to. And then we have these, yeah. these, these traditions that we do. Like the, the kids will drop about anything for it. We have this thing called the Christmas Roast. Okay. Where you draw okay. names. And so you kind of draw names, but you kind of sometimes cheat and ask for a name. And it's like permission to roast someone else in the family <laughs> and just relentlessly tease them. And the kids are now involved in it. They film videos. They put on skits. So it's something you're like, ooh, this is what I'm trying to do is stack fa the favor that they want to keep coming back during these times. I want to create right. odds that they're like, that's something I don't want to miss, right? right? That's the tradition. I love it. But one thing I want, uh, like, we're going on vacation next week, right? So, like, I want to inspire this to uh, uh, guys at PHP Agency. We're going to Tulum next week, Cancun next week. And a lot of them haven't thought about this. Isn't it funny that we're in the life insurance business and yet some of our life insurance agents have not thought about this concept yet? Uh, but if I, was going, if I was going to inspire a quote-unquote family retreat, and we're in Tulum in the next uh, three, four days next week, what can I simply introduce? What can I encourage our guys to simply introduce this to the family on a quote unquote vacation? So I think focus on three basic things and emphasize at least two of them on the vacation. Every great religion, corporation, or long standing family that's got family wealth has three things in common. Number one, they've all initiated rituals in their life. Rituals are those things that you do on a daily or weekly basis to reinforce the habits that you want to create success. The second thing is traditions. Traditions are the things that you come together for. I mean, we've got our traditions that a lot of people have with Christmas or Easter or we just had Valentine's Day. Like those are those are traditions, but like family traditions where you say, hey, like we do this thing that we call the Christmas roast. It's a family tradition. And <laughs> everybody gets to draw a name and then you get to relentlessly tease them. <laughs> it, you know, and sometimes we make videos, sometimes we create skits and it's the most anticipated thing in the year. That's a tradition that we look Love forward it. to. And yeah. it's one of those things that the kids will go, oh, I don't care what my friends are doing. I want to be with my family. 
So that's why we like traditions. And a tradition we want to initiate this year, we're calling it the Summer Olympics. And everybody gets to create their own thing. It could be anything from, you know, uh, basketball or, or cornhole or fly fishing. Like, what's the thing that you want to do? And then we can have a little competition around it. And then we have this ugly, terrible green jacket that I won when I was Summit of the Inner Circle in insurance way back in the year 2004. And they gave me this oversized green jacket like I'd won the Masters as a child because I couldn't fit into it. Big shoulder pads, way too long. And I'm like, that's the Summer Olympics jacket. If you win and you have to take pictures of it in places, you shouldn't be wearing it and send it to the family. So these, this is what I mean by traditions, things that kind of call you forward, like a family retreat could be a tradition. You might have a place you go to. We like to go to Italy every summer when there's not restrictions with COVID. And that could be a tradition. And then finally, symbols. Like I see you've got symbols on your shirt right now, yes. right? Yeah. Logos yeah. that are yeah. identifying markers. When you go to my cabin, You'll see right above the fireplace is a massive crest built like it was from medieval times out of steel. And it's got our symbols on it. And my, my kids can describe what it is and what it means to them. And so when you have rituals, traditions, and symbols, this is a big part of what you start with, with the family retreat. And rituals and traditions bring out a lot of fun because you can say, what is one tradition that we could create that we would love to do every year that we would come together that is just a Sapala family tradition, right? Yeah. And you just you like get everybody's ideas because people support that which they help to create. And then rituals could be, hey, I want to do a family meeting every week, or we're going to do a bedtime routine, depending on the age of your kids, right? Like you just create these rituals that become parts or little vignettes and space in your life that call forward an investment into family. Because I think legacy is the thread that we weave while we're alive that then impacts people while we're here and after we're gone not just the money we leave behind. And so rituals and traditions are some of the most useful tools to create a lasting legacy today.